Testing. Good morning, everyone. This is Janae Burr with OCDD Central Office. I'm just doing a speaker check. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. This is Janae Burr with OCDD Central Office. I'm still watching a number of people joining the webinar set for this morning. So I'm going to give it another minute and then we will get started. Thank you. Okay, good morning again. This is Janae Burr. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for the OCDD waivers needs-based assessment process and also the introduction to the LA Plus resource allocation. Um, we're gonna get started. Um, Ms. Casey Stevens will do the PowerPoint presentation today. Just wanted to let all of you know that if you have any questions related to the webinar that's being completed today, we are planning to record this webinar, as well as record the questions in the chat. We will have all of those um, available to review at the conclusion of this meeting. We also have another webinar scheduled for August the 17th, tomorrow at 9 a.m. Um, we are going to get started. Uh, we will be watching the chat as well throughout the presentation. Again, if you have any questions, please email janae.burr at la.gov or lavasha.gordon at la.gov at the conclusion of this training. We will be working closely with Ms. Casey Stevens to answer any questions and offer any technical support as needed. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us this morning and I will turn it over to Ms. Casey Stevens. Good morning, give me just a few minutes and let me find our training. Okay. Okay, here we are. Okay, so as Janae said, uh, I'm Casey Stevens. I am the Assessment and Support Planning Coordinator uh, for OCDD. Um, hopefully you all have an idea of why you are here this morning. Um, for some of you, um, the LA Plus is uh, sort of a new thing, um, but that's okay. Uh, we're going to introduce it to you. It is not difficult. It really isn't. Um, for some of you who have been here for a while, the LA Plus, um, you are probably quite familiar with. Um, so we're just going to do a bit of an introduction to it and sort of a, a bit of a reorientation to the assessment. Um, we're going to cover some of the items that um, have been a little bit confusing for folks over the years, and uh, we're going to discuss the new resource allocation algorithm. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, the new um, 
routine support checklist, um, which is uh, the checklist that identifies the uh, medical, physical, and behavioral health uh, more complex support needs that some folks might have. Um, so let's get started. Okay, so the LA Plus is an assessment that we have created here in Louisiana. Um, it's intended to identify and document useful information um, for planning supports and services. It's not comprehensive. Um, it was originally created to accompany the supports intensity scale or the SIS. And it was originally only used in the new opportunities waiver. Um, we did, it does provide a good starting point in terms of support planning for our support needs. And it does, of course, um, serve its purpose for our uh, needs in terms of providing for our resource allocation system, um, along with the routine supports checklist. It's fairly easy to administer um, and it's fairly easy to train. Um, in general, it identifies or provides a place to document um, things like current living arrangement and related services, uh, some support needs, again, it's not comprehensive, um, identifies factors and considerations that would impact support needs and identifies uh, medical and behavioral health diagnostic information. So as many of you are aware, the LA Plus has been used in all adult waivers to assist in support planning. Um, administration of the LA Plus was conducted as part of the tiered waiver process and has been completed upon enrollment at the beginning of the first tier adult waiver. Um, now, of course, the LA Plus was also used to supplement information from the SIS for resource allocation purposes in the now. And then scores from the SIS combined with the community safety variable score from the LA Plus is how a person's resource allocation level was originally determined. Now we will continue to use the LA Plus and all adult waivers to inform the support planning process. So this doesn't change. Um, but we are now going to make a change with how we determine the new opportunities waiver resource allocation levels. Instead of using SIS scores, we will, will be replacing the SIS entirely with the LA Plus. Um, we'll be pulling information, information solely from the LA Plus, along with a brief LA Plus checklist that we've created which, as I just said, identifies medical, physical, behavioral health support needs. And then the LA Plus will now become the basis for our resource allocation levels in the now, at least until our EISP begins. Okay, so why are we making these changes? Well, we have found challenges in maintaining staff and resources, and we've come across several cost concerns, uh, particularly with the SIS. Um, and OCDD has determined that continuing to use the SIS was not really sustainable long term. Um, also, um, as you probably know, OCDD is moving to the EISP in the very near future, um, which will require a full reevaluation of our resource allocation system um, and as we move toward the consolidated waiver. So this sort of temporary step aligns with our future plans and allows us to create more efficiencies in our assessment and our planning processes um, since all of our adult waivers already use LA Plus. This will really streamline the process and should allow us to um, better prepare as we transition to the EISP. Um, 
with the way that the current tiered waiver process works, uh, the lower tier waivers, like the supports and the row waivers, provide services that are really more similar to what you would see if you were a level 1A or 1B in the now. Um, by the way, for those of you who don't, are, are not familiar with the levels, levels 1A and 1B together account for about half of the participants in our service system. Um, so we really no longer have um, new uh, level one folks with true level one needs coming into the now anymore. Um, I, I say true level one needs because uh, if a level one person is approved to move into the now because of unmet needs uh, that the supports or row could not meet, that means that this person pretty likely has some unusual life circumstances that um, although they, they assess at a level one, there are circumstances present which put them in an outlier category, which means they'll, they'll need more support hours than what a level one recommends in the now. So they would be over allocation for a level one in the now, and this is to be expected. Okay, so what is staying the same? So support planning with a person-centered planning process. That stays the same. We're not changing any of that. The tiered waiver process stays the same. A person can still request to move up to the next waiver if during planning they find that they have unmet needs uh, that cannot be met uh, with the current waiver and the current supports and services they have access to but they feel that the unmet needs could be met by the, the next tiered waiver. The core LA plus assessment remains the same. It is still completed for a new adult participants only uh, with the supports waiver offer as part of the planning process. Um, levels two through six in the new opportunities waiver um, it stays the same in terms of the support needs uh, description profiles, um, the support need recommendations, um, all of the information that was originally provided in the guidelines for support planning uh, specific to those levels. All of that information stays the same, um, just like we originally established in the our resource allocation system back in 2005, 2006. Um, the amount of hours per level that a person can access with no other approvals needed or the recommendation of hours that should meet their needs within that level, all of this stays the same. Um, and then, of course, additional hours can still be requested beyond their recommended hours for their level. Um, and then the figuring of hours and the support needs uh, must be determined by a person-centered process. Justification documentation is still needed and this has to still follow the current process, the GIPS work pro process, which probably most of you are familiar with. So what is different? Um, well, obviously only one assessment will now be used in the planning and assessment process. We will be discontinuing the SIS. Um, I'm hearing cheers, although everyone's muted. I know that, I know I am. Uh, the new opportunities waiver resource allocation algorithm will now be based on scores on six items from the LA Plus, in addition to scores from the routine supports checklist, which we will go over. Um, something a little bit different. Um, so in the past, Louisiana had to um, pay for um, use of the SIS 
which required use of the, the document, the forms itself. We also had to pay AAIDD um, for training. Um, because we own the LA Plus, we no longer have to pay those additional costs. Um, since the LA Plus was developed by us um, with feedback from our stakeholders and was designed for use in our service system and we own it, um, we no longer have to pay those additional costs um, outside of our system. So that may not mean much to you all, um, but for us, it's, it's kind of nice. It's kind of a big deal. Um, another thing that's different, um, the original SIS levels 1A and 1B uh, will now be combined in the new resource allocation system. Um, so if you'll remember, like we just discussed, because of the tiered waiver process, um, even if a person is assigned to level 1A or 1B, they would be already an outlier in over allocation if they're approved for the now. So they would just get assigned to a level one. Um, we've made an addition, of course, to the LA Plus to identify specialized support needs that are routinely provided. Um, so the uh, routine supports for medical, physical, and behavioral health needs checklist, um, we call it the routine supports checklist for short. Um, it is similar to um, the CIS section 3A, 3B, but it is more specific to our uh, particular state service system um, and identifies those more complex support needs surrounding medical, physical support needs and behavioral health support needs. Now, in terms of reviews, um, the exception request for nows or the request to bump into the now um, will need to be reviewed uh, to make sure there's no obvious contradictions or discrepancies between LA plus resource allocation scores and the information that's documented in the plan. Um, the nice thing about the, the algorithm that's based on the LA Plus is that it's quite transparent and easy to understand. There's no um, standardized scores. There's no scores that have to be converted into something else. Um, it's very upfront and easy for everyone to understand. So it should be really apparent to everyone what a level uh, a person sh should fall into. Okay, so with this new approach, um, existing participants with an already assigned level, uh, CIS level, um, they don't have to do a thing if their needs are met and if they are satisfied with their current supports and services and the hours they are using. They can continue to use their old CIS level for as long as they need to. Um, if their needs change and they need different services or more hours, uh, if they think they need to be reassessed again to determine if they should be assigned to a different level, they can request a reassessment, which is basically just going in, updating the LA plus as needed, and then completing that new checklist. Um, this can be done uh, and approved at the LGE level. Um, and then they will be reassigned a new quote, LA plus level, um, which is, again, the, the LA plus levels are the same as the CIS levels. Um, so there really is no change. They'll just swap over to the equivalent level uh, based on their uh, identified new needs. For uh, initial or new participants, the LA plus and the routine supports checklist is completed as part of the planning process instead of what we used to do, which would be the CIS and LA plus when the person is given their waiver offer, the information from these assessments is, should be used to help develop the support plan for all adult participants. Um, this expectation stays the same. If a 
person requests a move to the now, that level is determined upon approval and can be issued by the sort committee along with the approval for the bump. And just remember that for the exception request, the supporting documentation for the resource uh, allocation scores and the scores in the routine support checklists, all of this information needs to be uh, included and documented in the plan. Um, the support team will need to thoroughly explain why the person's needs cannot be met by the row. They'll need to demonstrate how the person has exhausted all of the options available to them in the row to attempt to meet those needs in order for them to be approved to go into the now. Uh, that's part of the tiered waiver uh, protocol. So once a person is in the now, should they need additional hours beyond what their level recommends or allows, the request to get extra hours follows the usual process it always has, which is the GIPS work process at the LGE level. Okay, so we'll just briefly talk about how we, how we got it and how we developed the LA plus algorithm. Uh, Casey, this is Janae. Yeah. Are you able to stop for just a moment? Cause I have one question and somebody wanted to pose it. Um, I'm okay. not sure if you're able to look at the Q and A. Um, um, let me see. Okay. Okay. Um, is this the same question? You should have two separate questions, but the second one sent at 9 is part of it. Yes. Okay. And then there's another one that's coming in. Okay. Yeah, we're probably going to have a few. Why don't we hold these until afterwards? Otherwise, we're going to be probably quite a bit delayed with the training, if that's okay. Um, because there's gonna be a lot of what if scenarios that we'll need to take one by one. Um, and I really don't wanna hold up the training, if that's okay, okay guys. Okay, we'll hold it and just continue to track them. Thank okay. you. Okay, so let's talk about the stats real briefly. Okay, so keeping in mind that the goal of our resource allocation system in the now is to recommend a particular amount of IFS hours that should meet someone's needs, um, we did the following. So we identified um, key items in the SIS original algorithm and we identified what those needs were really about. So if you recall, the original algorithm was based on uh, home living activities, community living activities, and health and safety, so A, B, and E. Um, so we identify that home living activities were basically about uh, identifying or looking at support needs surrounding ADLs and IADLs, and community living activities were based on or identifying support needs surrounding IADLs, some communication and interaction abilities, and then academic and some knowledge-based skills. And then health and safety was surrounding or identifying ADL skills and then academic and knowledge-based skills. So then using that, we identified some LA plus items that were most likely to correlate with those needs identified in the SIS. So for instance, how independent a person is with ADLs and IDLs and academic and knowledge-based skills is pretty likely to correlate with or impact their LA plus scores on the unsupervised time item and the level of monitoring and awake hours item. 
So people independent in ADLs and IADLs and who have higher amounts of academic or knowledge skills probably need less support. So they will have probably higher scores on the unsupervised time item and lower scores on the level of monitoring and awake hours item. And similarly, um, with the communication and interaction skills, um, which was identified in the CIS, we found that it was probably likely to correlate with the LA plus um, communication item and the summoning help item. So people who can communicate and interact more independently with less support um, will probably score lower on the communication item and the summoning help item on the LA plus. So this was our theory. So based on this, we created proposed LA plus levels, which sort of were equivalent to the CIS levels um, based on these particular items and then created a range of scores. But then we have to put it to the test to see if it actually holds up in real life. So then we needed to conduct some analyses and we pulled about a sample of 100 CIS assessments and support plans. We analyzed about uh, 20 um, plans and assessments. Um, based on existing CIS levels, levels two through six. And we took a sample from each CIS levels and compared them against the proposed LA plus levels using these proposed resource allocation items and scores. And we found that in 91% of the CIS levels, they were confirmed to be into the equivalent LA plus levels. So we found that our resource allocation items mapped over fairly well from the CIS to the LA plus, identifying the same needs and then people still ended up in the same level 91% of the time. 9% of the CIS levels were reassigned to different LA plus levels. Of that 9%, 6% got reassigned one level higher 3% got reassigned one level lower. So we did find some overlap of scores in two levels. Of those reassigned to a lower level, one person was already under the original resource allocation amount. So they were already closer to their reassigned LA plus level. So out of the nine total that were reassigned, two people would need to do a GIPSORC request for extra hours in order to get what they are getting now in the scenario. So all of that to say, we don't anticipate a huge influx of GIPSORC requests for extra hours because of these changes to the LA plus algorithm and how the levels are being determined. So here is some of the information broken down by level. So as you can see, the LA plus levels four through six were pretty clear cut based on a combination of using the LA plus scores and the routine supports checklist. Everyone in the original CIS levels four, five, and six were confirmed to the LA plus levels four, five, and six. As I just mentioned, we did see some slight overlap in scores between levels two and three in our analyses. 70% of the people we assessed in the original CIS level two, we confirmed into the equivalent LA plus level two. 30% of those twos ended up assigned to level three. 85% of people assessed in the original CIS level three, we confirmed into the equivalent LA plus level three. A very small 15% of these threes ended up assigned to level two.
Okay, so this is how the uh, LA plus algorithm sort of breaks down for what we call the core levels, levels one through three. They are based on scores in six LA plus items, plus an absence of the cutoff scores in the routine supports checklist. And then the specialty levels, which are levels four through six, they are determined based on two LA plus scores plus meeting cutoff scores in the routine supports checklist. Okay, so we'll get into more details about uh, administering just general tips, and then we'll get into specific items. Okay, so um, the, <laughs> the LA Plus has been around for a while, um, and over time, um, the um, programs that have supported it have started to, um, new software has come out, but the PDF form itself has not been updated. So it's, it's gotten a little glitchy. Um, so don't be surprised if it does some odd things. Overall though, it seems to be holding up. Um, we have found though for best results, make sure that you're using an up-to-date version of the Adobe Acrobat Reader DC. And then we found that if you open the program itself first, then open the LA Plus form within the program, once you've opened up the program, um, that seems to work a little bit better. Um, worst case scenario, if you have to, you can always just print out the LA Plus form, but generally this seems to work. So there are a tips and additional guidance built into certain areas of the form. Um, you'll see little exclamation po points in yellow, um, look like this right here, and you can click on those to provide you additional information. Um, you can also hover your mouse over uh, certain icons to display additional information or instructions. And then if you hover your mouse over the radial buttons, it provides you uh, descriptions or definitions of certain the responses that you can choose. Okay, so we are no longer requiring folks to have to upload this the LA plus into that old sys LA plus database. Um, but in accordance with record retention and maintenance policies, you still need to maintain electric or paper copies of the LA plus uh, on your participants. Um, and then obviously, because we're not concerned with uploading this stuff into the database, you don't need to be concerned with the tallied scores on the summary pages, although a lot of that is already automated. Um, and you don't have to worry about uh, validating the results um, so you can skip those portions. <clears throat> now, in the past, um, assessors were required to complete all text fields, check all the boxes. Um, part of this was because all of that had to be done in order to upload it. Um, this is no longer needed for all of the items. There are some things that you can skip, uh, specifically the demographic information, like the social security number and the address. Um, obviously, you already have this information, so there really is no need to go repeating it on every piece of paper. Um, this information is in the participant services database. It's already going to be on the person support plan, so there's really no need to put the information here. Um, the, uh, in section three, part A, the, in the diagnosis section, um, we really don't do anything with the ICD-9 code. 
So you don't need to um, spend time looking for that and, and posting that here. In section three, part B for the medications and dosages. If you can attach an up-to-date medication list to the LA Plus, you don't need to spend time typing that out and filling that in here. Now, these are the only items that can be skipped. All of the other items really need to be completed. But hopefully this will shave off a little bit of time and you can put that time toward plan development. Okay, some other general tips with administration. Obviously, we want a person to be present uh, if they want to attend. Um, if they want to attend only part of it, that's okay too. Um, other respondents that should be present are people that are familiar with the person and their needs and routines. So no new staff, no hospital staff. Um, we really need respondents who are familiar with the people. Um, avoid having just one respondent. This includes having just the participant be the sole respondent. You're really gonna get a more accurate picture of a person's needs if you have two or three respondents who provide support in different situations and in different settings. Um, while they may provide different answers, um, the assessor's job is to sift through the information to get at the most common answer or the most common type of support need across different situations and determine the appropriate and accurate score. So good respondents would be teachers, job coaches, foster parents, family members, um, again, people that are familiar with the participants. Another thing, establish rapport. Spend time getting to know the person and family. Ask interesting questions. Ask more personal and fun questions. Make a connection with the person before you dive right into the assessment. Um, it, it doesn't have to be a boring process. So make good use of this time and really get to know the people that you're supporting. Allow for about an hour and a half uh, for time to go through the entire LA Plus and the routine supports checklist. It may not take this much time depending on their support needs, um, but this will give you time to really discuss thoroughly, ask follow-up questions, and really take good notes for planning. Remember, this is all part of the discovery process, and this will be time well spent. Um, Remember that you don't have to have the entire assessment fully completed during the allotted time that you administer the LA Plus. Um, for instance, um, the comments section at the very end, you can expand the comments later or add to it later. Um, some of the things that we're gonna talk about later that you can put in the comments um, the additional uh, physician professional supports services that the person will be needing, share supports information, uh, the community safety variable information, sleep assessment information. All of this information uh, can be added later after the fact. So you don't have to have a full administration in an entire LA Plus uh, completed at that time. Diagnoses, you can make notes during the assessment and you can verify later. Um, you're probably going to need to check um, physician evaluations or records, and you may need to consult with the current treatment providers to verify the current diagnoses. Um, and remember that the respondent provides the information, but the assessor determines the most appropriate score. Um, this is a standardized assessment for which you all have had training 
and you can consult your supervisor or OCDD for more guidance to score appropriately. This is not a survey. Um, the only exception to this is in section four, which does have personal satisfaction item. Uh, the participant identifies a score based on their personal beliefs and values from their own point of view. So for this one item, we do want to hear from the perspective of the person who receives services. Um, so we would like the assessor to ask the person directly to rate the item. When a person is not able to or needs support to do so, the assessor can ask the other respondents what they think the person would say. So they may ask questions like, um, what do you think the person would rate his level of satisfaction as? And then they can follow up by asking things like, well, how do you know that? Or can you give examples? This helps us to make sure that we really do understand the person's perspective. We really wanna make sure that the information that we're getting here is from the person's perspective and not so much the perspective of mom or staff. Okay, so when you're asking the actual questions for the items, be prepared to provide examples or scenarios for some items. Um, you might need to provide examples of other types of equipment or technology for ma the material supports item, for example. Um, you might need to provide examples of what different types of positive behavior supports look like for that item. Um, when possible, Ask open-ended questions. For example, what kind of support or supervision do you need during the times that you're awake? Um, and then once a respondent has given you some information, you can follow it up by sort of verifying what they're saying. So does close proximity seem to fit you? This is defined as, and then you can give them a definition of what close proximity is. When open-ended questions don't fit, um, you can ask for the best choice or best fit. So um, for the uh, positive behavior supports item, you can say more than one of these statements about positive behavior supports might fit you, but which one is the one that fits you the best? And then to verify what they're saying, you can say, well, can you Describe for me what that support looks like, just to make sure that you're on the same page. Another example would be for the summoning help item. So you might say, when something unexpected or unfamiliar happens, can you usually handle it by yourself? Can you handle it if you can talk to someone on the phone? Or do you usually need someone there with you? And then you can talk about that in more detail. If you're unsure about how to score any items, you've got some options. So you can leave a blank and come back to it later on during the administration or make notes about the information that the respondent gave you and then follow up with your supervisor later to determine the correct score. Okay, so section one, the support needs scale. This is where all of our resource allocation items are. And as you can see, I put the RA next to those items. Um, you also, if you haven't gotten it yet, we will make sure that you do get it. Um, the resource allocation uh, algorithm, which has those items listed out. Um, so there will be no secrets or surprises. Um, just so you understand what they are. Um, this is the largest section and likely to be the most time consuming part of the LA Plus. Um, so we'll go into 
each of these items uh, or the resource allocation items a little more in depth. Okay, so for the material supports item, it identifies technology, equipment, modifications related to communication, mobility, ADLs. Um, for levels one, two, and four, you may see the presence of mobility equipment, but people will be using it probably independently. Um, they're gonna be independent with lifts and transfers. Uh, for people in levels three and five, you're more likely to see mobility or lift and transfer equipment, but they're gonna need help to use that equipment. So they won't be independent. And that's the big difference. Um, there are some hover over icons in this section that you can use to provide you with more information. Be sure to check the H, uh, which stands for have, for technology equipment mods that are in place now and that the person actually has and uses. Um, check the N for needs. Um, if there's tech or equipment um, that a person needs but doesn't have yet. So this is really identifying unmet needs. Um, be sure to put this information in the plan as a support strategy or get a referral if you think that, that they might need to be evaluated. So in terms of planning expectations, um, remember that everyone deserves the right to communicate their needs and wants. So if a person is scored as needing partial or full assistance. Um, we expect that the support coordinator or team will support the person to have access to communication tech or equipment that helps them to effectively communicate. And if they don't have it yet, we expect that the support coordinator and team will get an evaluation or referral. Everyone should be able to communicate in some form or another. And we also expect for those who don't communicate using words, the communication log in the plan really needs to be thoroughly completed. Everybody communicates. It just may not be with words. So they may use facial expressions. They may use sounds or gestures, or they may use technology or equipment. So this is an example of what the section looks like. As you can see, you've got the have versus need on the left side of the columns that you can check. In the other fields, we've provided some examples of types of support that you can list, like eating or nutritional support supports, medication administration supports, toileting, bathing supports. Uh, we've also created a handout for you that we will email to you. Um, so you can begin getting familiar with some of the available technology and equipment that's out there that could help a person become more independent or at least do things more safely. Um, you know, the right piece of equipment or technology can really change a person's life. So um, this is a really, really good place to, to dig into and ask lots of questions um, to make sure that we're really looking into these areas thoroughly. Okay, the support for communicating needs. So for this item, we want you to score the item with the person's communication technology or equipment in place. So whatever you identified in part A for material supports, score this item with that stuff in place. Don't score the item as needing partial or full assistance if a person's technology allows them to communicate without help from other people. So partial assistance means a person has some communication limitations, 
but can partially communicate some needs or communicate in familiar situations. So they may need communication support from familiar people in new or unfamiliar situations. Full assessments means a person has significant communication challenges and is very limited in the methods they can use to communicate. They need communication support from familiar people to communicate on their behalf in nearly every situation. In terms of planning expectations, if a person is scored as needing partial or full assistance, we want you to make sure the person has access to communication tech or equipment if it meets their needs and allows them to communicate more effectively. Get a speech language pathology evaluation or referral if they don't have that in place. And the communication log must be thoroughly completed. Everyone communicates. So we do not wanna see blank communication logs if a person does not communicate with words. Okay, positive behavior supports. Although this item is called positive behavior supports, it's really not just talking about challenging behaviors targeted by a professional with a support plan. So with the lower scores, this item is actually capturing support provided formally or informally to encourage learning of basic safety skills, self-advocacy, becoming aware of one's environment or surroundings, um, to encourage learning, following rules of different activities or events, and learning basic social etiquette. Um, and then as we get into the higher scores, the emphasis shifts more into mental health, behavioral health side of things. This item is not just capturing support provided by a DSP or a parent either, or even just by waiver services. Some of the support referenced may be provided by a teacher's aide at school uh, or by a counselor at a mental health center. That's why, for instance, a person may be assigned to a resource allocation level one, be completely independent with ADLs, can pay their pills independently and have unsupported time every day, but they may have a score of four here because they're working through symptoms of depression and they're getting some support from a mentor to work through that. So for the instructions, be sure to choose only one response and you select the score that's most applicable based on the most common type of support typically provided. In terms of the breakdown and how you'll see it with the levels, levels one, three, and five Generally, you're gonna see a range uh, among the scores of one to four. Occasionally, folks might get a score of five. For instance, if pica uh, or wandering types of behavior are present. Um, for folks in levels four and six, which is our more sort of complex behavioral support needs levels, um, you're gonna see scores of five or higher. Just to give you a little bit more information about the PBS item. So score of one obviously is no support. A score of two would be a support to learn or use basic safety and emergency response skills advocating, protecting oneself, um, establishing boundaries. A score of three would be support to learn or follow typical rules in different environments, including school and work. Um, this includes obvious rules like not talking in class or not leaving your work site, um, but also rules to follow basic social etiquette rules or expectations. Um, so this score applies to those who know the rules and expectations and just don't wanna follow them, as well as those who 
are unaware of the rules and expectations and need support to learn them. A score of four is support to complete uh, typical daily life activities because of disruptive symptoms of mental health diagnoses like depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, but also for symptoms of conditions like autism or ADHD. So a person may have difficulty getting up and going to work every day because their depression symptoms cause them to feel lethargic and distracted because they're not sleeping well at night. Um, an autistic person may have difficulty with sudden changes in routines or with completing certain activities that need to be completed. With a score of five or higher, with these higher scores, you're more likely to see that these behavioral health issues are more complex or severe to the degree that the person is more likely to have some professional involvement um, they may have a current behavioral health provider, or they may have had a treatment provider in the recent past. Um, and then maybe staff and family are just maintaining those strategies learned from those professionals. If the person is not currently having any form of behavioral health treatment or oversight, and they've not had any in the past, but you're scoring the item as a five or higher, one question that should come to mind for you is why aren't they getting behavioral health services? So that should be something you should be digging into. A score of six and seven. So there are two key, two key phrases here that are really important we need to focus on. One of them is highly structured environment. So we should expect with a score of six or seven, that there is a specific list of do's and don'ts or support strategies about access to certain people, locations, or things, hopefully based on professional recommendations, but at least based on support team risk mitigation discussions. And then the next item is specially trained staff. So we would expect that staff working with a person has gotten some type of specialized training above and beyond the basic requirements for a DSW. So if both of these requirements are not met, highly structured environment, specially trained staff, if both of these are not met, then do not score this item as a six or seven. So with a score of seven, this really should be rare. We don't support a lot of people. They engage in imminently life-threatening behaviors. One thing we're going to recommend here, which is a bit of a slight change, is that if a person is endorsed as a community safety risk on item L, which is our community safety variable, then we're also going to recommend that you score them as a seven here. Endorsing a person as a community safety risk ensures that they are provided with 24 hour supervision because of the risk posed to others in the community. So scoring them as a seven here just sort of make things consistent across the board. Now, as far as planning expectations, if a person is scored as a five or higher, the documentation for the score needs to be present. In other words, why was the score that way? Um, as well as any behavioral health professional recommendations or guidance uh, that was given either in the past or currently, this really needs to be in the plan or the attachments. So here's just a little breakdown. This is what the positive behavior supports item looks like. And this is how the levels might um, play out. Obviously, this is not set in stone and you can see there's some overlap with the score of five.
Okay, so with physician and professional supports, we're wanting to identify all services that a person needs and will be using. You'll select from the frequency drop down box and scores will automatically appear. So a lot of this is automated. Um, if the services are not yet in place, just take your best guess as to the frequency of services. Um, something to keep in mind when you're filling out this section here. Um, the list of services is not all inclusive. Um, so like everything that a person may need or use is not necessarily included in this list here. You may need to look elsewhere um, to identify other services the person may need or use. Um, and then include those in the comment section in the back. Some uh, places to consider looking are evaluations, um, older plans, and the person's um, son, the screening for urgency if need. Um, there's some differences I wanted to point out uh, that I think um, sometimes people get confused on. So, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor. They prescribe medication, um, which is different from a psychologist, which is or can be a PhD or a PsyD. Um, a psychologist conducts therapy. Uh, a licensed PhD or PsyD cannot prescribe medication. Um, there is a newer type of psychologist, so sort of a blend of the two, called a medical psychologist that can prescribe medications and also can conduct therapy. Um, I just find that a lot of times people use their term psychiatrist and psychologist interchangeably, um, but it's really important to understand that they are um, trained differently and they provide different services and they have different banks of knowledge. Um, so depending on what the support needs are, um, a psychiatrist or a psychologist may be needed depending on the need. Um, on the uh, list of services and supports in this section, there's QMRP listed, but there is obviously no QMRP in waiver services. Um, so you won't need to worry about that. Um, these services uh, are not in the LA Plus, but they might be something that participants might need to access in addition to waiver services. You've got your applied behavior analysis services for children, home health services like physical therapy, occupational therapy, nursing, respiratory therapy, hospice, um, and then there's all the behavioral health services available through a person's health plan. Now remember that all waiver participants have access to all of the Medicaid state plan services in addition to the waiver services. Um, and they get to choose one of the Medicaid health plans based on which one works best for them. Um, in terms of planning expectations, remember that the information from the LA Plus and then any information you get from the Sun it's really just a starting point uh, for services identification, um, but it's not an all-inclusive list. So you'll need to talk with a person in the family and other team members to make sure that all of the services, waiver and non-waiver, are in the plan. Um, one of the assumptions of our planning process is that people will have a variety of different types of supports and services in their life to meet their needs. This means they will have both waiver services and non-waiver services, some formal services and some informal services like natural supports and community services. The IFS service, the CLS services, the PCA services, these were not designed to meet every need of every person. So our goal should never be to fill a person's day with just that type of service. Otherwise, we're going to see some unmet needs. And remember that the expectation with the tiered waiver process is before requesting a move to the next tier, 
you're supposed to plan using all available services based on where the person is right now, including waiver and non-waiver, formal and informal, and community-based resources to meet a person's needs. Okay, so here's an example of what this session looks like. As you can see the frequency drop down box there, at the top in that sort of middle column. Okay, so moving on to protective supervision. This is another resource allocation item. Because the focus of our resource allocation system is on allocation of IFS hours, uh, the item here of interest to us is the item asking about unsupported time um, outside of school work or day program. Um, so this is what we're looking at is amount of unsupported time a person can safely have with reasonable risk mitigation strategies. Um, so, you know, you need to look at uh, safety risks, med medical health risk, behavioral health risk to determine risk mitigation for unsupported time. And you can see for the levels here, we have some of the assumptions based on the levels and based on our description profiles. So for levels four through six, for unsupervised time, this item really isn't factored into our resource allocation level determination. But scores on this item should be consistent with our assumptions for those levels. If they're not, you probably need to be going back to double check some of your answers and responses and should be questioning if the level or the scores are correct. So for those in level four, it's possible they might have some unsupported time, but likely not a significant amount. For those in level five, we're assuming because of their complex medical needs, they will have very limited amounts of unsupported time or none. For those in level six, for the most part, we assume no unsupported time because of the risk posed to those in the community. So we assume they will have support and supervision needs due to their developmental disability and its impact on their challenging behaviors. Now this assumption is not necessarily applicable to all level six people. Just because a person is in level six does not mean that they have to get 24 seven supervision. For those who engage in criminal activity and have been found competent to stand trial or face charges in the past, these people do not necessarily require 24 hour supervision. Their determination goes back to the person's developmental disability. Do they have challenges in understanding or learning to such a degree that they need support in making decisions and staying out of trouble because they do not understand the consequences of their decisions? If so, then yes, they would need 24 hour support due to how the disability affects their life not because of the behaviors they engage in. On the other hand, if the person understands the consequences of their decisions, 
and they're just making bad decisions or making decisions that we don't necessarily agree with, then this is not related to their developmental disability and this is not a supervision issue. In these cases, they may not require 24 hour supervision. We can talk about this in more detail. And if these scenarios come up, you're always welcome to reach out to us, discuss the details of those as well. In terms of planning expectations, you need to document in the plan and the attachments when and why a person needs physically present person or supports for supervision or for risk mitigation. You also need to document allowable times for unsupported time and any risk mitigation strategies for those times. Can the person send home uh, staff hurt early without any great risk? Note this in the plan or the attachments. If the LA plus identifies that the person cannot have unsupervised time, this also needs to be noted in the plan along with the reasons and with staff, staff strategies to follow if the person decides to refuse supervision or wants to send staff home early. These scenarios should be discussed during planning before the plan is implemented so that the provider staff know what they need to do. For example, maybe the staff strategy is to call the supervisor and wait outside the person's apartment until a backup staff or a family member gets there. Or maybe the staff will be required to call APS regarding self-neglect. If frequent reviews are occurring, the team needs to meet and further discuss to address the issues and identify why the person is refusing. Maybe need to reevaluate the way the person's needs to determine if they actually do need supervision and then revise the plan strategies as needed. Continued refusals bring up things like whether health and safety can be assured in the waiver or other legal considerations depending upon the risk present. One thing that we can never forget is that support planning begins and ends with consent. Consent is still required in all aspects of planning, including for those people who are considered to be community safety risks and need 24 hour supervision. Of course, we're referring to adults here who are competent majors with no court restrictions or court orders in place. Waiver services are voluntary, which means that people can choose to receive them or not receive them. People get to choose when, where, how they receive the services they need and when they don't want them. Remember that people must provide informed consent when agreeing to their plan and all of the strategies in their plan. We do not get to override consent or a person's refusal but we do need strategies in place to address these issues if they pose a risk. So in essence, we cannot have long-standing inconsistencies between the assessment and plan and what supports are actually being provided in real life. Okay, so with the nighttime support item, we're looking at support needed during a typical night, not the best night, not the worst night from staff or family. Again, we're looking at um, IFS type based supports, not professional, not nursing supports, not licensed type supports. <clears throat> so there are three things to consider with this item the type of support, the most common type of support, the frequency, how often it happens, and the daily support time, which is the cumulative total support, the cumulative total support time devoted toward the whole night. 
there are hover over icons present to provide additional information. Consider when you're rating this, the nighttime assistance that someone might need to provide during the night. So this could be support for lifts and transfers, support for repositioning, support for bathroom trips, uh, support for the CPAP or the oxygen, um, supervision or support for behavioral issues like wandering or running away, um, any support related to other behavioral health issues. People with autism, they don't always sleep so well at night. Um, support issues related to anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder. A person who is manic, probably not gonna sleep so well either. Um, all of these can cause difficulties with sleeping. Um, so caregivers may need to provide support related to medical or medication issues. Uh, people may have insomnia because of medication side effects pain, sleep apnea, uh, reflux. The nighttime support scores, these should be consistent with the information that you have in section three in the sleep assessment. So the, another resource allocation is the uh, level of monitoring item. This is a level of monitoring during awake hours, and you need to consider the proximity, the frequency, and the format of supervision that's needed while the person is awake. And these scores need to be consistent with the unsupervised time item. <clears throat> Just like the other item, the uh, level of monitoring during awake hours is not factored into the resource allocation level determination for levels four through six. But the score should be consistent with our resource allocation assumptions for those in levels four through six. So for those in level four, they don't necessarily need continuous on-site supervision, because remember, they may have some unsupported time. So you may see a score of monitoring or higher. With those in level five, you're likely to see close proximity or higher. With those in level six, you're likely to see on-site or line of sight earshot. <clears throat> and remember, this is not applicable to those who engage in criminal activity and are understood to be competent to stand trial and face charges. For planning expectations, similar to the unsupervised time item, you need to document in the plan and the attachments when and why a person needs a physically present person for support or supervision or risk mitigation and you need to document allowable times for unsupported time and any risk mitigation strategies during that time. Uh, if there are times or occasions when a person needs more intensive or a closer level of supervision, note this in the plan also. <clears throat> Summoning help. So this is about the level of assistance needed to handle unfamiliar or unexpected situations and the ability to summon help when needed. This is not just about life-threatening or emergency situations. This involves judgment, safety skills, and communication. So people with fewer skills will need more hands-on assistance and may need more physically present assistance as opposed to remote assistance. So this is not just about the ability to call for help in emergency situations. The scores here should be consistent with a person's scores in part D, which is communicating needs, and also part I, which is protective supervision unsupervised time. In terms of planning expectations, for those who will have unsupported time, risk mitigation strategies need to be documented. This includes making sure they can handle some situations on their own, but can also call for help when needed. 
The plan and attachments need to note how they will call and who they will call for help when they need it. And also needs to note any learning strategies or skill building goals to improve independence and ensure their safety when they're alone. Okay, for the sharing supports item, this is not a resource allocation item, but it has, it has caused some confusion over time. So we're looking here at identifying risks or support needs present, which impact shared support situations at home. So the first part of the question is, can the person share supports in a home setting? <clears throat> if you answer no, you will need to provide an explanation of why not in the comment section at the back. Um, assuming that a person or the assessor answers yes, the person can share. Then the next question is, in a 24 hour day, how many hours total of one-to-one -one support would a person need? So determining how much one-to-one -one they need during the day is based on support needs with ADLs, uh, typical daily medical behavioral health support needs, accomplishing goals, et cetera. So you need to consider the typical level of support, intensity, or proximity of supervision during awake hours. So consider looking at uh, their needs based on pos positive behavior supports, protective supervision, and look at the information in their routine supports checklist, and that will help you make a decision on this. So keep in mind, this item is not identifying or asking, do you want to share supports or will you share supports? It's asking what are the risk or support needs related to that? Can a person share supports? So do you want to share or will you share? These are important questions, but they're not relevant for the purposes of this assessment. Remember our resource allocation assumptions. Nearly all people in waiver services can share supports at some time or another. The resource allocation levels assume shared support hours or levels two through five for those who don't live with family. And those in level six are not precluded from sharing supports, but extra precautions or risk mitigation may need to occur. We need to dis distinguish between when a person could share supports or use other services versus when they have to have one-to-one -one supports. Remember that there are other services options that can meet a person's needs. In terms of planning expectations, advantages, options with shared supports must be explained regularly to participants. Sharing is still a choice in waiver, um, documentation requirements with casual and roommate sharing is still required. You can check the guidelines for support planning for additional information. If you'll recall, the home and community-based support setting rule has a lot to say about informed consent and making sure that participants are making informed choices about their plans and their services. People cannot make informed decisions if they are not truly educated about advantages and options of the shared support service compared to other services. Okay. So with the community safety item, um, if you recall, this was uh, a resource allocation item on our old resource allocation algorithm as well. Um, this item identifies those who engage in extreme challenging behaviors or criminal behavior, which pose a significant risk to the community and need specially controlled environment that limits one's ability to leave the home supervised or needs 24 hour direct supervision, even when leaving home. 
So this item was originally designed to assess for and identify those people who engage in extreme challenging behaviors, which are viewed as harmful or potentially harmful toward others in the community. So the Human Service Research Institute specifically names murder, fire setting, rape, pedophilia, as examples of these extreme types of behaviors captured by the CSV. So in theory, the frequency, intensity, and or severity of these behaviors is so significant that they've resulted in arrest and, and conviction in the past or likely to resus, result in arrest and conviction in the future. As a result, these persons require 24 hour supervision in a secure setting or controlled environment to reduce risk. So we have more specifically defined these behaviors, which should be considered public safety risk behaviors, which warrant a community safety risk endorsement. They are extreme physical aggression, See. extreme or extensive property destruction and sexually aggressive behavior. With sexually aggressive behavior, we're looking at attempted or actual rape through physical force, threats, coercion, or rape of someone unable to give consent, sexual battery, or other forms of sexual assault, or any form of sexual behavior toward or involving children. There are two endorsements that can be made. A person can be convicted of a crime or not convicted. Um, there are hover over uh, buttons that you can hover over to give or get per additional information. Um, something to remember is this label, community safety risk, often results in limitations and a stigma for a person. So accuracy is really important here. Um, some questions to consider to help you decide if this is appropriate um, are, do we have verifiable documented information versus alleged accusations and stories? Is it just a history of a behavior, or is it likely to occur again if supports are not in place? What is the risk? Who is most at risk? Family versus neighbors versus strangers versus children? Are there specific targets, or could anyone be a potential victim? So to clarify, a history of a behavior that is no longer present or a history of an arrest and conviction due to other types of criminal behavior is not defined as extreme. So a person convicted for public intoxication, possession of marijuana, some of the burglary, they do not meet criteria for a CSV endorsement. Also, those who have been found competent to stand trial or face charges in the past, even if there is a risk they will engage in these extreme behaviors again, will not be endorsed as a public safety risk and will not receive the CSV endorsement if there are not professional or court requirements for supervision in place. Ultimately, this means they do not need supervision from a developmental disability waiver as the issue present is not related to their developmental disability and its impact on their decision-making ability. As we previously discussed, the determination goes back to the person's developmental disability. If the person understands the consequences of their decisions and actions, and they're just making bad decisions, then this is not related to their developmental disability and this is not a supervision issue. In this cases, they do not need 24 hour supervision from a DD waiver service to stop them from making bad decisions. 
So CSB endorsements really should be rare. It is estimated that approximately two to 5% of our entire population at most should have the CSB endorsement. An explanation or justification for endorsement needs to be in the comment section. And don't forget that folks that meet criteria for this need to be as scored as a seven on the positive behavior support item. Uh, in terms of planning expectations, the continued accuracy of this endorsement should be reviewed annually along with appropriate risk mitigation and least restrictive methods for supervision. Remember that no matter how high the risk is, participation in waiver services is voluntary and consent is required. Therefore, competent major adults must still agree to any suggested limitations or rights restrictions put in place. Okay, so section two is actually quite short. There's really just a handful of items. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory and the instructions are provided. So I really wasn't going to go over this section. There was just one item I wanted to um, point out. Um, and here you can see I've circled it. Um, the reset button in part C if you wanted to reset all the values back to zero, you just click reset and it resets everything back to zero. Okay, so for section three, the medical and diagnostic information. This is also a pretty small section. Um, how long this section will take pretty much depends on the, probably the number of diagnoses you'll have to record. So we're looking for current active diagnoses, not historical diagnoses um, that have been discontinued. Although this is the historical information is a good information to have in the plan. It sort of paints a picture and provides good background information. For current active diagnoses, you may have to consult multiple documents or current treatment providers to get a current list. Um, remember that you don't have to complete the entire LA Plus all at once. Um, when deciding what diagnoses to include in the LA Plus, consider the following. Um, when in doubt or when there's discrepancies among different documents, go with what the current treating provider says. Uh, remember that the 90L document can be wrong. The PCP may be unaware of other diagnoses um, that other providers have given the person. So consult other documents or other providers. Um, older psychological or psychiatric evaluations may not have current diagnoses. Behavioral health diagnoses, um, just like health diagnoses, can be acute or chronic. Um, so they can be replaced with others over time or they can be discontinued. Um, so don't just list all of the ones that you find in all of the documents because they could actually be contradictory. If a particular psych eval or progress note um, can't provide specific symptoms of a behavioral health diagnosis and actually describe how it affects the person, then there's a good chance it may not be current. And it may just be a carryover diagnosis from years ago that is no longer accurate. Um, so be sure to double check and ask the current behavioral health provider what the actual current diagnoses are. If you're unsure if a diagnosis is current or outdated, you can simply state in the plan this diagnosis was given by so and so on such and such date, but it's unclear if this diagnosis remains active and is reflective of current symptoms or something to that effect. Um, 
you'll notice that on the LA Plus, it references uh, the diagnoses of mental retardation. Um, as most of you probably know, this is an outdated term. Um, we no longer use this term. Um, this term has been replaced with intellectual disability um, in the plan. It has not been updated in the LA Plus. Um, people with disabilities have told us that they find this term offensive. Um, and over time, it has been come a way to insult and demean people. So we no longer use this term. Um, you may have uh, become aware over time of the Erase the R Word campaign. Um, so we are just, uh, we are just encouraging that we just not use that term. Um, we are encouraging participants and families um, to let you all know that if they see this term in their plan, that they can request that their plan be updated with more appropriate and respectful terminology. And we will be reminding participants and families that they have a right to review and approve their plan before it goes into effect. People have a right uh, to review their plan and review the information in their plan and the language in their plan. So whether it's the use of person first language or identity first language, whether it's a particular nickname they want to use or whether they have particular pronouns they prefer to use. We expect everyone to treat waiver participants with respect and to honor these requests. Um, with the diagnosis section, you can skip the ICD-9 code as we had said. Uh, in terms of planning expectations, the historical diagnoses are important to have in a plan, but they're not our focus of treatment. Um, for the active current diagnoses, there should be identified symptoms that are specific and individualized to the person. We do not wanna see a Googled list of general symptoms that may appear for a diagnosis. We want to see a specific list of symptoms that that person has. Okay, so as I had said earlier, with the medication list, you can skip this part if you can attach an up-to-date medication list. Um, planning expectations. Um, it needs to be obviously attached to the plan um, or a part of the attachments. Um, one thing to note, be sure that the correct name of the prescribing provider is listed for each medication. Uh, do not simply just list the PCP for all medications. More than likely, if a person has behavioral health diagnoses and psychotropic medications in place, the PCP is not the prescribing provider for those medications. Okay, the sleep assessment. It identifies potential sleep challenges, unusual sleep habits, changes in sleep patterns. Um, this is important because it identifies um, important changes and clues us into other bigger issues. Um, and it's also an essential function for the human mind and body, and it's essential for wellness. Uh, so it's really important that people are getting good sleep every night. Um, it keeps us at our best health-wise and mental health-wise. Um, so if stay at family or staff are saying that people are missing sleep, or they say that a person is only sleeping for a couple of hours or night or haven't slept for a couple of days, do not ignore this. Dig further to find out what's going on. This is a big deal. This has some serious impacts. There are three items that are part of this sleep assessment. Uh, does the person have trouble sleeping at night? This could be related or due to physical issues. It could be due to mental or emotional health issues. Or it could be a medication side effect. Do they sleep more than nine hours per night? 
This is the second item. So if it's a teenager, I'm not gonna be quite so worried about that. If the person is 75, that's really outside the range of normal. So I might be a little more concerned. In a 24 hour period, how many hours does the person sleep? So, you know, if they're sleeping more during the day and less at night, it could be they're getting sufficient sleep. It's just their schedule is flipped. So again, this is an area where we need to dig further and find out. The information from this needs to be consistent with the information that you have in the nighttime supports. And because the sleep information is mostly yes, no answers, to provide more information and gather more information, you need to put this in the comment section. For planning expectations, be sure to give a description of the sleep issues and what the team is doing to dig further and investigate. Document as needed in a sleep log. Document the activities during the sleeping hours. Look at med changes with a physician. Refer to a professional if this continues. Keep digging until the cause and the solution is found. Remember that this is a big deal. All right, section four has that personal satisfaction item. If a person scores it of zero, which is dissatisfied, obviously this would probably need to be a point of focus for the plan year. And remember the comments section is an area where you can further describe and go into details about supports and services needed for the upcoming year, share supports explanation, community safety endorsement and explanation of why, and then additional sleep assessment information. Okay, so the LA Plus routine support checklist. So this is the additional checklist that we've added, which helps to identify folks that need to go into the specialized levels four through six. It's similar to the CIS section 3A and 3B, but it's more specific to our service system. So we've redefined some support needs. We've identified those nurse delegable tasks and we've clarified some of the support strategies. <clears throat> For each item, you'll score uh, each item or support strategy of a one, meaning moderate support or a two of intensive support if those support needs are present. And remember that the cutoff scores here determine membership in our specialty levels. So for our medical physical support needs, we're looking at supports that are routinely provided, likely daily, but at least weekly to maintain required medical or allied health treatment, support the pre prevention or treatment of medical conditions, or provide physical nutritional support. For the behavioral health checklist, we're looking at supports provided regularly to prevent or intervene with occurrences of challenging behavior and or illegal behavior and or maintain prescribed mental health treatment. The support that we're discussing here in this checklist is provided by non-professionals. So we're looking at support provided by staff, family, babysitters, neighbors, um, support provided at home or in the community. We're not including a rating support provided by nurses, psychologists, or other licensed professionals. The support needs are current and necessary and will continue to be so. So we're not looking at historical support needs. So is it support that the person is receiving now and needs now and will continue to need for the foreseeable future in order to prevent or manage the symptoms or maintain the treatment? So this applies to medical, physical, or behavioral health issues that would occur if caregivers did not provide certain supports on an ongoing basis to prevent it. So this would not apply to supports that are needed temporarily 
to address an acute or temporary situation. For example, a person is recuperating from surgery and the related support needs are only expected to last for perhaps six to eight weeks, then scoring those support needs here based on that temporary condition is not really reflective of the true support needs once they're better. So scoring that here would not be appropriate. <clears throat> if necessary for temporary changes in support needs, you can do a support plan revision to temporarily request more support hours over allocation. This can be submitted along with documentation explaining that need. This does not require reassessment or adjusting the ratings on the routine supports checklist or the LA plus. So for the routine supports checklist, we're not rating a history of a condition, a diagnosis or challenge of behavior. These are not scored here. So the support needs here are also typically more complex versus daily living skills or the supports needed for that. The supports discussed in this checklist are more complex because they're related to medical and behavioral health conditions or symptoms. Their needs are not as common or as simple as support needs related to ADLs or IADLs. In most cases, the staff or the family have had some type of training or at least recommendations given by a professional to prepare them to provide the support. And if the support for the, these issues were absent, it would likely pose a health or safety risk either immediately or over time. So these things are not rated on the support list. I just wanted to go over this real quick. Self-management of conditions. Uh, if a person can independently complete something themselves, it doesn't need to be scored here. We're not rating diagnoses, medical conditions, behavioral health conditions. We're rating the support provided to assist people with managing those. So you're not scoring how severe a condition is, or you're not scoring how bad or disruptive a behavior is. Rather, you're scoring the support that the caregiver or supporter must provide to prevent or manage it. We're not providing support with daily medications um, here on this. Um, providing medication administration assistance is considered a common and typical daily living support need. Pretty much everybody takes meds. Uh, it's not considered a more complex support. Support with diet. Similar to daily meds, providing support with meal prep and eating of even prescribed diets is not considered a more complex or intensive support need. Everybody eats. And a significant number of people require assistance to prepare their meals. These are common and typical daily living support needs. But meals received via tube feeding is scored here if support is needed from a caregiver or supporter. Um, support needs related to vision or hearing impairments. Uh, the support needs related to those impairments are not considered more complex or intensive. This is because they're more likely to impact basic daily living activities and those related support needs. And this is consistent with disability related services provided for many participants. So we have created a standalone guide, which we will email to you, which provides you more detailed information about understanding each item uh, what to score, what not to score, understanding the differences between a score of a one versus a score of two, and how to explain to the respondents what the scores mean and uh, what the items are defined as and how they're defined. Um, you don't have to memorize our, uh, the, the guide or the definition of the items. Um, you're welcome to use the guide during the administration. Um, for the other item that's on both the medical, physical, and the behavioral health checklist, there's a space provided on the answer form that you can fill things in and write 
it in. I'll show you that to you in just a moment. So with asking the questions, I would suggest start general, think it's specific. So you can ask for like the medical physical support needs. Do staff family routinely provide support to maintain any medical allied health treatment or to help prevent or treat medical conditions or provide physical or nutritional support? If they answer yes to any of that, you can begin going through the entire medical physical checklist. For behavioral health, you can ask, do you routinely provide support related to preventing or stopping challenging behaviors, legal behaviors, or helping to maintain mental health treatments that a professional provides? If yes, you can begin going through the behavioral health checklist. So to present an item, a specific item, you can say, do you provide support for repositioning? This is defined as, and then you can read the definition of repositioning. Um, for a behavioral health item, you can say, do you provide support to prevent or stop physical aggression that can cause injury to others? This is defined as, and you can give the definition. Now, when it comes to assigning a score of one or two, if they answer yes, they provide support, then you can follow up with, well, can you describe what that support looks like or how you typically provide that support? Remember that as the assessor, it is your job to, dis to determine what the most appropriate score is based on the information that they give you. So you will determine whether or not their information fits the moderate or the intensive score. If they provide you information and they actually provide supports that fits in both the moderate and intensive category, then score it as two, but also check the moderate supports as well for documentation purposes. So I'll show you what the answer form looks like real quick. And then I'll come back to this and you can look at our email information. Let's see. Okay. So here's what the answer form looks like. The medical physical form is just one page. And as you can see, there are. Hey, see, this is Janae. Are you sharing that, that on your screen? I don't see it. Yeah, can y'all see it? Can you see it? No. Oh, okay. Let me try that again. Okay. How's that? Yes, I can see it now. Thank okay. you. Okay, all right. Okay, so this is the enter form for the routine supports checklist. This is the checklist for the medical physical support needs. Um, as you can see, the items are listed on the left column over here. And there are nine items with a 10 to capture other. The support needs that meet a score of one are listed in this middle column. The support needs that meet a score of two are listed in the right column. And you can just check on the box if uh, they describe supports that meet that criteria. Um, and then you can put either a one or a two here.
And then you can tally up all of your scores for the medical physical support need checklist and put that number here in that total score box at the top. And if this score meets that cutoff number, then that person will be in a level five. And here is the form for the behavioral health needs. There's a few more items on the behavioral health needs. I think there are 13 and then 14 is other, yeah. but it works just the same way as the medical physical checklist. And again, staff or family might say that they actually provide uh, support in both, both categories. And you just need to identify what is the most common type of support typically provided. If it's more in the two section, then score the score as a two for that item. If it's more is a one, that's the most common typical scored as a one. If you're really unsure or unclear, again, you can always talk with your supervisor or you can contact us and we can discuss in more depth. Later today, I can email out the guide that goes with this, along with some other handouts that we've created to help with support planning and uh, administration of the LA Plus. Go. the guide. Okay, hopefully you all can see our email addresses here. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, I am sorry that I ran over time today. Um, and I'm afraid to keep you any further uh, as we already have gone over 30 minutes. Uh, I am available by phone and email. If um, you all want to call individually and discuss in specific cases, um, if you wanted to write up a list of questions, and email them to me. Um, we can discuss by phone or email, um, however, however you wanna do it. Um, so you've got some time to uh, go over the information and think about it and pull together your questions. And then we can discuss. Uh, we won't be transferring to this new system until the end of August. Um, so we've got some time to do some follow-up Q and A's. Janae, is there a way that we can save the existing questions that have been posed and then I can respond to these separately? Hi, Casey. I did request for the questions, um, the Q and A to be recorded as well. I have not heard back from the OTS as of yet because I asked her to pull the chat, but if your question was not answered, I'm just gonna piggyback off of Casey. If you could 
kind of catalog all of those questions and send them to all three of us, then we'll work together. Once you get all the information from Casey, uh, Lavash, or myself today, we will catalog all of your questions. And then that way we can summarize and get that information back. And then we can work with Casey if you need to meet with her one-on-one -on -one to ask specific questions, if that works for all of you. The only thing that I ask that is if you send an email, please put in the subject line that is the RA slash um, LA plus question so that that way we can pull those questions and kind of talk through them together so that we can respond back. Um, just as a safety precaution, I would ask that if we did not answer out of the Q&A that you send those questions to us as a backup plan. And again, thank you all for being patient. And I apologize again for going over. I usually time these better. <laughs> um, I, I guess there was a little bit more information here than I anticipated. Um, and I'm sorry that we did not get to your questions. I promise that we will get to your questions and uh, we will devote plenty of time to make sure that we do answer all of your questions and concerns. Um, and uh, I, I know that some of you who are maybe a little bit newer might be somewhat overwhelmed. I promise this is not difficult. Um, and once you have done it a couple of times, I suspect it will become much easier than, than, you, than you think. So um, please feel free to reach out and um, we will be um, available to answer any questions. Thank you everyone for your time today. For the support coordination agencies, please submit your sign-in sheet to Lavasha and myself. Thank you.